God uh, this morning then, and uh, it's more of a topical various text message, but to start with, let's go to Joshua chapter 24, please, Joshua chapter 24. Now, I know Sam recently preached from here, and uh, I don't intend to re-preach that wonderful message that he did preach, but uh, it's really just to focus on a phrase that comes up here uh, that I'd like to use as a, as a thought for our message this morning, and of course, most people are usually familiar with Joshua 24. It's one of those uh, uh, excellent chapters of the Bible, and uh, we're given great encouragement, great strength from it. Uh, verse number 15 uh, is, uh, is, is often one of those verses that you remember, you memorize, or, or the, uh, the end part of it is it, it plaques on walls on homes, and it certainly sits, uh, sits in my living room. It's a, it's a thought that is... Uh, 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 often challenging uh, to me, but um, let's just read it together. We'll read Joshua 24. I want to uh, read from verse 14 just to verse number 16, just to give us a bit of a flow. Joshua, of course, who'd taken over from Moses, led the people across the River Jordan into the Promised Land, uh, fought many great battles as the Lord went before him. Uh, took possession of the promised land as the Lord had called him to do, showed great faith, showed great resilience, was a man of God and a man of faithfulness. Here we are at Joshua, of course, coming towards the end, end of his life, older in years, and he's seen so often what we do see, that uh, even, even the people of God, uh, very often if they're not challenged by the word of God, not living for the Lord, tend to go, as we said, the other week, backwards, rather than forwards, and that can be, uh, you know, hugely disappointing and discouraging. But as a man of God, he set forth a challenge to the people, and, uh, and he planted a flag in the ground declaring his own position. So let's pick it up at verse number 14, and just read down to the end of verse number 16. The Word of God says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. That's a great thought in and of itself, isn't it? You can't serve the Lord if it's not in truth, and you can't serve the Lord if you're not sincere. You can't fool yourself, and you can't fool God. And put away the gods, not the small g, which your father served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And uh, people will always have a tendency to follow false gods, self-worship, and everything else. The nation of Israel reminded God flooded the world, saved Noah and his family, as the world had become evil and wicked as they followed false gods. And even when God's own people were in Egypt, which is a picture of the world in the Bible, the things that God's people will go after are, are, are not good sometimes. Verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's always a choice. God always gives us a choice, and that was the substance of the message the Sam preached to us before. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So a passage we're very familiar with, particularly the end of verse number 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's a great, that's a great piece of scripture to have in your mind, in your home, in your head, and in your heart. But if I could just draw your attention to that one singular phrase, as for me. That's the phrase I'd like us to be thinking about this morning. We're going to take a look at that uh, in the Bible, as for me. God is speaking to you as an individual this morning, the same as he speaks to me. I'm speaking forth the word of God. The Lord speaks to me through his word, and as a preacher of the word of God, uh, prepares me and prepares you to receive from his word. But the center and the substance and the dividing line of everything in your life, time and eternity are based upon the decisions that you make. As for me, everything comes down to the individual. Everything comes down to you. No one else can have a relationship with God for you. No one else can live your life for you. No one else will give account to God for you in the day that you all will meet him, regardless of your condition here this morning, but you'll either meet him as savior or judge. But only you will give account. As for me, 
So it's on that phrase, as for me, I'd like us to think this morning with the thought of the title of the message is, what about you? What about you? Where do you stand this morning? Let's take a moment and pray before we look at this thought today. Father, we come before your word. We bow before your supremacy and authority. And we look to a good and a gracious God. A holy God, as we've heard sung this morning, a thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, said Isaiah, when he saw you high and holy and lifted up. And Father, we look through the eyes of faith this morning and we see a holy God, a just God, a righteous God, and a loving God, completely balanced. And our Heavenly Father, you have not created us as automatons and robots. Lord, you created us, you gave us life, but you've given us free will. The choice to choose. And Father, every one of us in here today make choices, multiple choices every day. But the choice is where are we with you? Where are we with Christ? The choice, the choice that makes the difference for all time and eternity. As we look at this phrase this morning, as for me, from your word, Lord, help us, every one of us in here this morning, to not think this message is for someone else. To not think you're speaking to the person next to us, in front of us, or behind us, or who's not even here. But God, I pray you'd speak to us today. Reach in by your Holy Spirit, confirm your truth, bring conviction where needed, comfort where needed, challenge where required. But Lord, may your word do its work today. Help me, O oh Lord, as I preach your word this morning, not to get in the way of your word. Touch hearts, heads, homes and lives this day. We ask you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So that phrase, as for me, is used in 24 verses of the Bible, all of them in the Old Testament, interesting enough. That phrase doesn't appear once in the New Testament. We're going to take a look at three of them this morning, three that I hope will show us three different elements of, uh, of necessity within our lives as we live our Christian lives. Or for those of you this morning, maybe here that you're not Christians, may show you your need of Christ, your need to be saved, may see from God's word what is necessary for you, for us as individuals. What about you? Firstly, in this verse here, Joshua 24, I know we read uh, 14, 15, and 16, but I'm concentrating, of course, on the phrase, as for me, in verse number 15. But what we see and get a sense of here in Joshua 24, 15, firstly, is Joshua's pleasure. That's, that's what I think the as for me, Josh, as for me, Joshua says, it is my pleasure to serve you, God. It is my pleasure to be one of your people. It is my pleasure to to take a stand, even regardless of what everyone else around me does. Joshua's pleasure. Firstly, there's a recognition. There's a recognition in Joshua's pleasure as for me. You know, that's a recognition every single one of us needs to come to because it's this. It starts with you personally. It starts with me personally. God is speaking to us personally. God will hold us to account personally. God wants every one of us to come to Christ, to have our sins forgiven personally. It's not about someone else. The Lord is speaking to you. Joshua recognized that. As for me, but no, it stands as a contrast. But as for me, you see, it, it, it's, it's a recognition that we live our lives personally. Joshua, as God's man was saying even to the rest of God's people around him that were not living right, that were not going right. They were the same as the world. They had adopted sin and wickedness. They were following after things they should not follow after. And he said, you shouldn't do that. You're going backwards in time. You're going backwards in life. You're going back before the flood. You're going back into Egypt, remember, which was bondage, representative of sin and slavery. And he said, God brought you free from that. And, and, and over this time period of being left to your own devices, you've gone back and you're going full circle as the dog returneth to his vomit, the Bible says. You go that 
to which is no good and start licking that which is unclean, start tasting that which is unclean. But uh, Joshua said, but as for me, he said, I'm planting the flag. I'm drawing the line. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the news that you need to hear. I'm telling you the truth that you need to hear. He said, and you can choose this day what you do with it, but there's a recognition for, on Joshua that it starts with personal choice. But as for me, Joshua said, I will not be swayed by peer pressure. I will not be swayed by the majority. I will not do what the crowd do. I will not go on the broad way that Jesus spoke about that the majority are on. I will go to the straight gate and stay on the narrow way and few there be which go in thereat. Joshua says, I'm joining the few. Even amongst my own crowd, my own people, my own nation, if you're making the wrong decisions and going the wrong way, Joshua was saying, it doesn't matter if I'm the only one, but as for me, personally, I have made my decision. The great reformer John Knox said that one with God is a majority. New Testament book of Romans says, if God be for us, who can be against us? You're far better off being one with God than one in a crowd without the Lord. It starts with you personally. What about you this morning? Where are you personally with God this morning? Because the Bible says you're either on his side or you're his enemy. There's no neutral ground. So I haven't made a decision. I get that. I remember what that was like for 39 years of my life. I didn't actively make a conscious decision that I was going to be God's enemy, but the Bible says that's it. If you're not on the Lord's side, you're on the losing side. What about you? Joshua's pleasure was, he said, it starts with me personally, and it is my pleasure to make a decision. It is my pleasure to make a declaration. It is my pleasure to stand forth. So we notice his, his pleasure was the recognition. That's where the pleasure starts. Friends, that's where true pleasure starts for all of us in life, isn't it? Recognizing that as for me, I must make the decision to go on with the Lord. I must make the decision to trust Christ. I must make the decision to come apart and come away from all that is wrong in life. I must make that decision just to trust in God himself, what he has done for me in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that in a little while, but it starts with you personally. Joshua's pleasure was not only in the recognition, but he thought there was a responsibility. Look what he says. As for me, that's the recognition It's personal, and my house. That's the responsibility. See, it starts with you, but it doesn't end with you. No man is an island. No man liveth unto himself. No man dieth unto himself. Joshua says, as for me and my house. Now, let's start in the context of the Bible. This is the man talking about the leadership of his family. That's God's plan. That's God's design. He said, this is the 21st century. We don't have to put up with anything. You don't have to do anything. No, you don't. You say, that, that sounds like misogynistic, patriarchal hate speech. You call it what you like, it's just God's truth. You can put whatever label you like on it, it's God's truth. Joshua, the leader of his family, of his wife and his children, he says, as for me, I'm doing the right thing. I'm not listening to the nation. I'm not listening to the stupidity. I'm not listening to the nonsense. I'm not listening to the non-biological facts. I don't care if they call it trans hate, transphobe, homophobe, misogynist, patriarchal. I don't care what they call it. As for me and my house, because I am responsible for my house. God made me the head, co-equal with the wife. She may be the neck, but God is the head. Uh, man is the head, as the Lord is the head of the man. As for me and my house, responsibility. Men, let me speak to you today. So, Pastor, I'm not even married. God willing, you will be one day. So, I never will be. Well, even if you're not, you'll know some people you are, and you need to tell them the truth. My house. Men, you are responsible for your family. If God has blessed you with a wife, if God has blessed you with children, you are responsible to make the right decision for you, and you are responsible to lead your family in that decision. Uh, we even get that in the New Testament, don't we? 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be 
strong. Now, unfortunately, we live in the times that we do live in. And what I've just said would be anathema to some. You know, if we had the feminazis in here today, they'd be baying for my blood. I'm just telling you what God's word says. I'm telling you what God says. You know me, I'm outnumbered. Wife and three daughters. Thank through the daughters are gone. Now it's just me, my wife and my mother. But I'm still outnumbered, right? And when they all descend tomorrow, they'll be my sister and everybody else. They'll all come down. I'll be outnumbered again. I've lived in a house of women. My dad died when he was young. My granddad died when he was young. I've lived in a house full of women. Jesus said, oh, God, this is, this is terrible. How can, how can I be the one responsible for my household? There's more of them, and they know what they've got, this wisdom and service. God says, stand up and fulfill the role that I have given to you. You've heard me preach before, men. Pick up your toolbox, put down your Xbox. There's too many game-playing men in our society. Now, before the couple of you that like to play your, I don't know, Xbox or whatever, I don't know what it's called. I lost track when Game Boy and DS is used to be in. I'm not saying you can't do those things, all right? I'm just saying get the priorities the right way around. Lead your family. Take responsibility. So well, my wife, she doesn't like me being a Christian. As for me and my house, well, that's just you do the right thing anyway. My children do the right thing anyway. It starts with us as men recognizing responsibility. You see, there's a recognition it starts with you personal, personally. There was a responsibility for your family. But thirdly, Joshua's pleasure was there was a ruling. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You say, what's that? That's free will. That's free will for the family. We will serve the Lord. Now, can I say the Bible puts that equally on the mother and the father to say we are going to serve the Lord? Go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. The man must lead. The man must set the environment. The man must uh, 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 show that his family can be safe and secure around him. The man must set the direction, follow the law. That's the responsibility for the family, but it comes down to the ruling, we will serve the Lord. But look at this in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 7 to 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where any true knowledge starts with the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, even God knows that. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, God says to, to the children, you pay attention to your mother and to your father. Dad, you'd better set the course so that the mother feels she's got the support in the home. But the rule of uh, the mother, the law of thy mother is the law in the home to the children. About what God is saying is the man must take the responsibility for the family. The man must then put down the ruling. We will serve the Lord. The wife can step up and stand up within the home and say to the children, this is what's going to happen. Guess what, kids? We're going to church Sunday. Oh, but, oh, but nothing. Get your clothes on. You're going to church. I don't want to go. When you don't live in this house anymore, you can do what you like. It's that simple. And a lot of people made church very, very, very hard. And uh, it's not hard. It's only as hard as you make it. Jenna was 10 years old, maybe 11, when I got saved. They, they'd been going to church on and off, all the saved and all the rest of it. You know, but once I got saved, then I was, I was uh, adamant. There was never any discussion in our house about, are we going to church this Sunday? We were going to church. That was it. Didn't have to have an argument, didn't have a discussion as they went through 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And for as long as they were under our roof, living in our home, we were going to church Sunday. To be fair, they never wanted to not go to church. But that's not the case for everyone. Well, kids, if, if you go, I'll give you this. You know, if you put up with the punishment and the torture of going to church, I'll give you a... You're conditioning your children. You're programming your children. We're going to church to worship the Lord. That's how it's going to be. That's how it will be every week. Check back with me in about 10 years, and if that's changed, I'll let you know. So what, what's that? 
Well, that's feminism gone mad and masculinity gone missing. All right, that's, that's, that's what it is. But it's about, you know, what a difference to Joshua that we live in the society now. You see, it used to be parents told the children what to do. Now the children tell the parents what to do. I'm not doing this. I'm not going there. I'm not putting up with that. You can't tell me anything. They tell the parents what they're not doing. They tell the teachers what they're not doing. They tell the policemen what they're doing. They tell everyone what they're not doing. And you know where that starts? It starts with putting little kids in stupid T-shirts that says it's all about me. No, it's not all about you. But you condition them from a young age that they're not being trained. Train up a child. I'm, I'm, I'm moving into a different sermon. Of vision. Train up a child in the way it should go and when it's old enough, depart from it. Don't train them up to think they're the centre. Listen, you know, that little that little gorgeous granddaughter of mine at the back, I, I would melt, I would do, you know, I only got to look at her and she'd get a butt. So I've got to stay strong, right, as she grows up. But it's all right, because I'm the grandparent. I can spoil and create all the problems and give it back to mom and dad to sort out, because it's mom and dad that does it. Doesn't say the grandparents are But isn't there a difference? Isn't there a difference? But it, it, it starts with, with Joshua's pleasure. But as for me, as for me, I've made my decision. As for me, the wife and family are on board, we're coming along. As for me, we will serve the Lord. There will be no doubt about it. The decision is made. There's no argument to be had. It is set. I just go to Genesis chapter 18. The Lord said exactly the same thing about uh, Abraham. It, the Lord looks at families, by the way. The family was the first institution that God placed upon this earth. Families are the most important thing to the Lord in that sense. But if there's a family, there's a responsibility. And the Lord uh, encapsulates this in Genesis chapter 18, in verse number 19, speaking of uh, Abraham. God himself says of Abraham, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God's blessing is on families that follow God's plan. You know, I've, I've got to be honest, we... We condition our society, to, you know, when they're 13, they turn into nightmares. Oh, they're teenagers. Oh, blah, blah, blah. That's conditioning and programming. You tell children from when they're young, you're going to be a nightmare when you're a teenager. Guess what? They will. But they're not if you don't program them. And the Lord says, you know, I know him. I know Abraham. He keeps his family right. He keeps his family before the Lord. He keeps his family in obedience and to account to the law. Now, I, I know the arguments. I know them better than you. Well, there's been so much abuses over time and abusive men, abusive this and that. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I spent 20 years working in the police and prison service. You don't have to tell me about crime. That's what the world calls it. God calls it sin. That's why Christ had to come and die. We can follow the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit. Okay, it's that. There's, there's, no, there's no law. You don't, you, you don't need it. Follow the Lord. We wouldn't need the laws in this land. We would not have police running around every week to drunken domestic disputes and, you know, uh, lockdown that was a pleasure for God's people to spend time with their family. It was a nightmare for many. You say, why? Because they're not following the Lord. As for me, Joshua said, it was Joshua's pleasure to recognize his place before the Lord, his responsibility before the Lord, the ruling to leave his family. As for me, Joshua said, what about you? What about you, husband, father? What about you, wife, mother? Is it your pleasure to follow the Lord this morning? Is it your pleasure to set the example for your family this morning? Secondly, let's move from Joshua's pleasure. Go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Samuel, the prophet of Israel. Samuel had that miraculous birth from the answered prayer for his mother, Hannah. Samuel went to live with Eli. Grew up knowing God's word. 
knowing the Lord, became a man responsible as judge of Israel. And we find here in 1 Samuel chapter 12, we, we, we won't read all of the chapter leading up to it, but if you're not familiar with it, you remember God set up his, his people, the nation of Israel, as, um, as a, a, a republican theocracy, no monarchy, no king. And the people of the nation of Israel looked all around them and saw everybody else had kings and monarchies. They said, we want that. We don't, we don't want the way that God set it up to be. We don't want to just be living under a theocracy, under the law of Moses. You know, God had given them a constitution and a, and a Republican leadership and all the rest of it. There was no king. There was no monarchy. But the people said, we want to be like everybody else in the world. We want a king. And uh, Samuel was telling the people, you, you're doing the wrong thing. You're going against the word of God. And Samuel went before the Lord and said, Lord, this is what the people are doing. And you know what God says? Tell you what, I'll give the people what they want. Many times the worst thing that can ever happen is God gives you what you want, particularly when it's against the word of God. But God said, I'll tell you what, Samuel, you go back and tell them. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, this isn't King James. You just go back and tell them, that's all right, you can have a king. Now, Samuel did go back and told him that. The Lord says you can have a king, but Samuel said, I'm telling you, it is wicked, and you are going to pay a price for this. And that's kind of the lead in and the lead up to, to, to this. And uh, it, it explained their wickedness and how it was against the word of God. And if we, if we pick it up at verse number 17, this is Samuel speaking. He said, is it not wheat harvest today? Now, I'm no farmer, but I know you want good weather for a wheat harvest. You want good weather to get a growth of wheat. You want the rain and the sunshine. But I know the farmers, when it comes to harvest time, I mean, they are watching the weather. They are waiting for the field to be perfect, but they can't have any rain. They don't want to harvest damp wheat. It goes rotten, it goes moldy, it goes off, it's no good. So they've got to get it in the time of harvest when the weather is dry. He said, is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain. This is God's man speaking to his own nation. He said, no, I'm going to call upon God to show you how wicked you've been by bringing rain in the time of wheat that you may perceive and see, so you can understand that your wickedness, he says, is great. Not great as in good, great as in large. Which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. You basically turned against God. That's what he's saying. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. As if we weren't wicked enough, we get it. We've turned away from the Lord. We're walking in a sinful way. We're not following God's word, God's will, God's way. And now to top it all off, We've kind of crowned that by saying, we want a king between us and you, God. We want you to stick a man between us and you. And that wasn't what the Lord wanted. Can I tell you, it's the same in this church today. In the true church, there is no man between you and God. Now, you've got some places around the world that cater to about 3 billion people that follow a certain cult. And it's called Roman Catholicism. And do you know what that does? It sticks a paedophile in a frock. If you've been keeping up with the news, no surprises there, right? Eh, in France, multiply that around the world. Between you and God. You go to the man. The man tells you what you've done wrong. The man absolves you. The man intercedes with God. The man comes back, says for you to do six-hour marriage, pray a car, we'll light a candle, and you'll be fine. Right? So what's that? That's putting a man between you and God. God says there are no men between you and God. We all have personal access and personal relationship to God if we choose him. He said we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, fear not. Okay, the Lord has shown some judgment upon you, but fear not. You have done all this wickedness. Yeah, you're wicked. But turn not aside from following the Lord. Go the right direction. Get things right. 
But serve the Lord with all your heart and turn you not aside, for then should you go after vain things, useless, meaningless things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Can God's people say amen this morning? The Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Do you understand that? It's God's pleasure that we would come to Christ. It's not because of anything we've done. It's because of what he has done. But look at verse number 23. Moreover, that's a bit like Joshua's but. You're all going the wrong way. You're all doing the wrong thing. You know that God's judgment is upon you. Moreover, as for me, here it is again, that individual planting of the flag by Samuel, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and right way. Do you see the similarities we see here again? You see, once again, we see it's personal. You know, Samuel's prayer is personal. As for me, there's no getting away from this individual responsibility. There's no getting away from this individual accountability. You can't say, well, everyone else was doing this. Everyone else went this direction. You can't even say, well, the government changed the law to make evil things good and good things evil. The government said it was the law. It doesn't stand. Because as for me. It's not about what the majority are doing. It's not about what the government's doing. It's not about what even seems right in the world's eyes and is wrong in God's eyes. You cannot get before God and say, well, everyone else was doing it. Everyone else thought it. Everyone else believed it. As we've seen from what we read this morning, we see week after week after week after week, the, the world has lost its ability to even reason logically and to think straightly. At what point do you want to jump off the cliff just because everyone else is doing it? God says, I want to see an as for me. You are my people. You have my word. I don't care what the world is doing. I don't care what half the professing church is doing. God says, if you've read it in my word, that's the truth. Plant the flag individually and you say, as for me, you turn against the tide, you turn against the crowd, and you walk into that opposition and keep walking, God says. You so, say, well, if I get a few more, no, personally. Doesn't matter if you've got someone else with you, someone else who agrees with you, a church behind. No, no, no. God says, you this morning, you sat in your chair. It's personal, but just like Joshua, it's plural. The responsibility goes out from God's people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and cease to pray for you. Do you see that plural element of the prayer? I'm planting the flag. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to pray for you because otherwise that would be a sin. Because why? You know, God tells us to pray for the unsaved, doesn't he? That they'll be saved. God tells us to pray for our enemies. God tells us to pray for those that despitefully, you know, people are really spiteful and nasty and mean to you. God says pray for them anyway. So that's the plurality of that as for me. I will pray for you, Samuel said. You're doing the wrong thing. You know you're doing the wrong thing. You're saying the wrong thing. You're going the wrong way. I am not coming with you. I am planting my flag. I am standing for the Lord, but I'm going to keep praying for you. Don't give up on your lost friends and family friends. Don't give up on them. I mean, they will drive you to the wall. Right, we know it. Now, we, we understand it, right, those of us who weren't Christians, and were, well, we all weren't Christians, and those of us who are Christians, and that comes in different phases of life for different people. But, you know, I, I understand it because I tell you where it starts. It, it starts with, it, it kind of starts with a bit of love. But then the concern grows because you planted the flag and then you go in a different direction. But no matter what comes from your friends, from your family, from the society around you, from your school classroom, from your workplace, no matter what comes, don't stop praying for them. Don't just pray you can get through it. Sam said, as for me, he will pray, but the prayer was for them. Sam said, I'd be sinning against God if I wasn't praying 
for me. Samuel's prayer was personal. Samuel's prayer was plural. Samuel's prayer was persistent. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will. Decision, determination. I will. What's that? Free will. In my free will, I will do this. I choose to do this. I will teach you the good and the right way. Samuel said, I might be the only one in this entire nation that's standing for God, that's standing for God's word, that's standing for God's will, that's standing for God's way. I might be the only one in this entire nation that's on my knees praying for the whole nation. He says, no matter what, no matter the opposition, no matter the adversity, no matter the ridicule, the rejection, no matter what comes, I will teach you. The right way. I will live the right way. I will do the right thing. So what's that? It's a decision. Persistent. I will. I will continue to live right. I will continue to teach you right. I will continue no matter what you throw against me. Go to Matthew 28, if you would. Matthew 28. See, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ said to us as Christians in a very, very similar way. You know, this is what we call the Great Commission, the risen Lord sending his disciples out into the world. Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, that's the state, the disciples, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So it's the same thing. Samuel said, I will teach you the good and right way. I am not bending. I am not changing. I know it to be right. But as for me, this is the word of God. This is the way of God. And I will teach you and I will live it regardless of whether anyone else believes it or whether anyone else does. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Go into every nation on the earth and teach them what Christ has commanded us. Samuel said, as for me, I will pray, I will take a stand, and I will teach them. What about you this morning? See, it was Joshua's pleasure when he said, as for me, what about you? It was Samuel's prayer when he said, as for me, what about you? Lastly, this morning, let's go to David, Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Psalm of David, the great king of Israel, the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> David, a man after God's own heart. No, he wasn't perfect, was he? None of us are. There's only one perfect, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one without sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 55, and I'd like to read a little bit of it by way of introduction and make a few comments. We'll pick it up at verse number four. So this is Psalm of David, verse number four, Psalm 55. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. So what's that physical distress? Maybe his physical health was failing. Aren't there a lot of people in our world today whose physical health is failing? Isn't that a great topic of the news at the moment? How many people's physical health are failing because they haven't been able to see doctors or get hospital treatment? Isn't that the topic of the hour from what I can understand? So I, I only say that to say this. This psalm is as relevant today as when it comes. There's people out there that are in physical distress because of their physical health. But I'll tell you this. The NHS may have the answer to your disease this time. But it doesn't have the answer to the disease that is the result of sin. We shall all die, 100%, every single one of us. And the NHS doesn't have the answer to that, nor ever will. Or as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We're all going to die, and we're all going to meet the judge. So the NHS won't answer your physical distress, because God has the answer. 
Verse number five, fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. What's that? That's emotional distress. Poor mental health. There's a lot of that in the world today. Sadly, there's a lot of that amongst our young people who've been shut up, cooped up, separated, and isolated for a long period of time. There is an epidemic of sorrow, sadness, and distress among young, healthy people who are nation imprisoned for a year. They've done nothing wrong. They were no threat to anyone. They were in no danger, yet we imprisoned them, and now we're reaping a harvest. So wind, whooper, what? Mental distress. Verse number six, and I said that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. That's the world answer, isn't it? I feel terrible, everything's going on. I need a holiday. Oh, that I would fly away like a dove on some Caribbean sunset, sun-kissed beach. That'll be the answer to all my problems. Two weeks of absolute bliss. You know what? You've got to come back, though. You can't fly away from all your problems. They'll still be there when you come back. And for many of you, and for many of us, they'll be there with you on your holiday because you're the problem. <laughs> now don't get all offended you know it's true <laughs> verse number seven lo then i would wander far off and remain in the wilderness so what's that i'll be better off somewhere else i'll pick up and start life again i'd be better if i lived here i'd be better if i left them i'd be better if i didn't do this or if i hadn't always going to be better the grass is always green on the other side of the fence well, doesn't have the answer for you. God has an answer for you. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. See, it's that escapist mentality. If only this, if only I could be here, live there, have a holiday this. If only this were fixed in my body. If only this were fixed in my head. If only I could get away from it all and start again. No, it's not the answer. Verse 9, destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. That city's for you. I've been a city kid all my life. You know, Ex Exeter's like a village to me. You know, I live Birmingham in London. I think Exeter's a big village. That's the way I see it. But it is it's turning into a city, isn't it? So what's in the city? The Bible says violence and strife because city living is anonymous living. And it encourages and promotes wickedness. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Stabbing an MP to death for doing his job. Verse 11, wickedness is in the midst thereof, deceit and guile depart not from her streets. It, isn't that the same today? Uh, we've got physical health problems, emotional health problems. Oh, that I can just be jabbed and everything will be taken. I can fly on a holiday and everything will be fixed. If only I could live somewhere else, everything would be different. It's terrible in the city where I live. It's going downhill. You know, it's full of violence and crime and drugs. And, and, and if I could just do something else, it would, God says, no, that's, that's just the results. Of sin, you can't you can't get away from it. David was right, but look what he says in verse number twelve. He said, "All the problem, all this distress, all this wickedness." He said, "For it was not an enemy that reproached me. When I could have borne it, then I could have borne it." He said, "I could have taken it if it was an enemy. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him." But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. David said, I could have taken all of this if it had been one of my enemies. You know what David's saying? He said, it's somebody really close to me that stabbed me in the back. He said, that made it unbearable. Friends, if you're a Christian in here today, you're, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have some suffering. You're going to have some difficulties. But the greatest and the most painful ones of those are going to be from the people sometimes that love you and know you the best, friends, family. Lord Jesus Christ knew that. Lord Jesus Christ prepared it for us. Go to Matthew chapter 10. You need to be aware of that because David is still going to say the same, but as for me. Matthew chapter 10. We're almost done.
You know the Lord Jesus Christ? His own brethren said he was mad. God, God the Son, the Son of God. But Matthew chapter 10, let's just pick it up at verse number 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Who confesses Christ before men? Christians. Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. That's the security and the surety we have in Christ. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. If I depart from me, ye curse it. I never knew you. So you must know Christ. Think not that I am coming. See, now this is the, the Bible goes against most people's understanding of Christianity. Most people think they understand Christianity and they come up with these phrases. That's not very Christian when you've just done something that is absolutely biblical and absolutely Christian. That's not very, by that I mean, that's not very Christian in the way I would understand it to be. That's because you don't understand what we're saying. Think not that I am come. This is Lord Jesus Christ speaking, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace for the sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against the mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's, here it is, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Isn't this what David just written in Psalm 55? He said, I could have taken it. You know, any, any of you that have been out there doing the door to door to the street work, street preaching, or, you know, witness for Christ in your college, your school, your workplace, you know, sometimes people get offended by the gospel, right? Don't be surprised they murdered Christ. He came to bring the truth. And David said, all of that distress. All of that difficulty was multiplied because it wasn't an enemy. It was someone I was close to. Jesus said, don't be surprised if and when you become a Christian. You know, that point in your life where you recognize you are a sinner before a sin was gone. Sinner by thought, word, and deed. We sin by the things that we do, and we sin by the things that we don't do that we should do. And we recognize that and we know that and we believe the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Jesus said, now you're a Christian. He said, I need to tell you in advance, don't be surprised if you have problems with people that are close to you. They'll be against you. Now don't misunderstand, it starts with love. You know, I remember when I first got saved, and, uh, you know, religion is, is fine. Religion doesn't, nobody bothers. Oh, you go to church, ding dong bell, sing a song, whatever. That's, that's for you. It's not for me, but it's for you. But we're talking about Christianity now. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about relationship. We're talking about a life lived for Christ. And in love, people close to you, you know, do not you know what I'm like joined a cult. Because I didn't just go to church and come home. We started living the Christian life. started reading the Bible. Started changing some things, swinging some stuff out of my life, not going to some places, not continuing on the way that it was. Next thing you know, I told, told we, we were off to, we were going to America to go to Bible college. We didn't actually go, but you know what? That was it. She came for three months when we talked to I understand that. Do you know why that was? None. She cared about me. thought I was joining the cults because I was going to take the grandchildren away from her. I get it. I understand it. You know, Sam ever says he's going back to America, he's going on his own in the crowd. <laughs> so I get it, you know, it was through love. It, you know, and, and that's that's where it starts, when it starts because of love. Well, you become a Bible believing Christian, your husband not saved, wife not saved, children, parents, whatever, they think you joined a cult. Don't they? This is a cult. Apparently I'm a cult leader, I've been told that many times. <laughs> You said before, I wish I was, because you do what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus Christ said that's what it will seem like. And those are, it will start that way, but then it will change and it will turn and it will be a hardness if those that love you don't get saved. Starts from love, but love and anger are two sides of the same coin, aren't they? And Jesus said, be aware. You see, David, just to finish off the psalm, uh, you know, in verse number 15, Psalm 
uh, 55 and verse 15. He said, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwelling and among them see wickedness can creep in. And here it is in verse number 16, as for me. I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been betrayed, I've been assaulted, I've been offended, uh, to the point where I was fearful, I was in distress. It wasn't an enemy, it was someone close to me. But as for me, it doesn't make a difference to my faith, it doesn't make a difference to my walk in the Lord. He said, but as for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. It's David's promise. He had the personal responsibility again. Look, this is the dividing line, as for me. That's the dividing line. Where are you this morning? Are you in Christ, out of Christ? Do you know Christ? Are you a Christian or are you not? That's the dividing line. But Christian, if you're a Christian this morning, God says, as for you, what are you going to do with what I have given you? You're going to go with the flow or go the right direction? You're going to keel over and collapse, or you're going to stand. But as for me, I will call upon God. You see, that personal responsibility was based in powerful sovereignty. I will call upon God because God alone is the only one who can save you. God alone is the only one who can strengthen you. David said there's a personal responsibility, powerful sovereignty, because I have predictable destiny. The Lord shall save me. Notice he says that in contrast to that in verse 15, when it's speaking about the wicked, let them go down quick into hell. That's the difference. That's the dividing line. You in hell or heaven this morning? So I'm, I'm in Exeter. I'm talking about your soul, your never dying soul. Are you in Christ or out of Christ? Because that's the dividing line for you this morning. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you recognized your sinful state? Have you received and believed in Jesus Christ? Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved this morning. Trust in Christ's work on the cross and be saved. That's the difference. It's the difference between two verses, but it's the difference between your eternity. In one verse, hell. In the other verse, salvation, heaven, eternal life. As for you this morning, where do you sit? You see in heavenly places with Christ was your place reserved in eternal damnation because your sins are unforgiven. Joshua said, as for me. Samuel said, as for me. David said, as for me. They were all men of God. They said, as for me. What about you this morning? Christian, where do you stand? Are you standing? If you're in here this morning and you don't know Christ. What about you? Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can receive Christ as you will say, be on the right side of the divided line of eternity. May God help us to take that stand as for me. It rests on you, it rests on me. It doesn't rest on you. Where are you with the Lord today? Father, we've come before your word this morning. And our Heavenly Father, you speak to us in a very forthright manner sometimes because your word is so powerful, so convicting. But Lord, sometimes our sin and our stubbornness are so strong. Father, help us to stand, help us to plant the flag, help us to take that personal responsibility and accountability and realize it is as for me. That we stand despite wickedness, that we stand despite any uh, oppressiveness, we stand despite adversity, we stand despite ridicule, we take a stand in the same way, not only of those three men this morning, we could have equally have used three women from the Bible, but we take a stand because as for me, I'm in Christ. Father, we want to follow you. And Father, we want to shine as lights in this world so this world can see there is hope. There is truth. There is eternity. There is a destiny that we can accept in Christ and in Christ alone. Father, touch hearts this morning. Strengthen 
Strengthen your people. Bring the lost, the unsaved to yourself this morning. Through Jesus Christ alone we pray. Amen. Amen.